Okay, so that's a setup to talking about um, what the United Nations has called the most powerful land management agency in the world. It, well, in a democracy. <laughs> I'm sure some dictators have more powerful, uh, more powerful agencies, but, but in a democracy, the California Coastal Commission is incredibly uh, impactful and uh, has, has been being impactful since it was created in the early 1970s. So let's talk about the California Coastal Commission. Let's actually start here. So the origin of the Coastal Commission lies in the birth of the modern environmental movement. The origin of the Coastal Commission lies in people in the 60s looking around and not liking what they saw happening to their coast, to the California coast in particular. They were seeing more and more development. They were seeing more and more restrictions on where the public could go to access the coast and, and do different activities on the coast. And they were getting ticked off. There were two primary things that drove uh, the sort of the final straw. One was the city of Malibu doing its classic Malibu things. The other was this development that you see here, Sea Ranch, which is up in Sonoma County, which originally was this thing that was going to be, yeah, we'll do this thing and everybody can use it. And it evolved into an, an area that was going to restrict um, the public's access of about 10 miles of the coastline. People started saying, wait a second, if we don't do something different, pretty soon all of the coast is going to be locked up. All of the coast is going to be inaccessible or less accessible to us. And we as Californians, as we've talked about before in this class, we like to define our identity as of or associated with the coast. And so this was bothersome to people. So what we did is exactly what you guys are voting on your ballots in the 2016 election. You know, a tons of propositions this year, right? More and more and more and more and more and more propositions. This was how this came to the forefront through, at the time, what was called Proposition 20. It was a vote of the people. This was in the 1972 election. And it said, hey, create this thing called the California Coastal Commission that will regulate activities in the coastal zone. Do that for four years. And it passed. And everybody said, yes, go do this. Form the, the first Coastal Commission. And, uh, and then in 1976, the state legislature said, well, I guess this is a good idea. Everybody seems to like it. So they passed what's known as the California Coastal Act that essentially codified into law those things that, that were put in, first put in there via the proposition method, but also this amended the state constitution to put these things within the state uh, constitution, th these elements. The California Coastal Act uh, seeks to do a bunch of things, a lot of things. So let, let's run through them really quickly. Um, firstly, enhance and restore the overall quality of the coastal zone. So make it better, make the beaches healthier, make the wetlands better, make the waters cleaner, that kind of stuff. Note that this is to enhance and restore the overall quality of both the natural and artificial resources. Artificial resources might be ports, harbors, uh, PCH, things of that nature. Next, assure orderly and balanced utilization and conservation of resources. So, so fundamentally written into here is this notion of trade-offs, balance. It's not, it's not you can never restrict public access. It's that we, we want to maintain public access and expand public access whenever we can. However, if we're putting in a nuclear power plant, I guess, I guess it's probably not a good idea to have everybody just be able to walk into the nuclear power plant, right? So this notion of balance. Perhaps the most uh, easy to understand component of the Coastal Act is the charge of maximizing, to the extent possible, public access. So that means people getting to and from the coast and 
affording recreational opportunities at the coast, however we want to define that. That could be fishing, that could be surfing, that could be whatever. Uh, flying our drones, some people disagree with, with us about that, but, but you know, whatever the recreation is at the time, that people can, uh, should be able to do that to the maximum extent possible. Uh, assuming that we have all these other things like conservation issues at, at, uh, uh, of concern and personal privacy rights, property rights. And that, that, that's a key point to this day, constant, constant fights over that. Next, one of the most important things is assure that what's happening in the coastal zone really should be happening in the coastal zone. For example, catching fish and, and processing fish. That's something that's, that's a coastal dependent activity, right? If we're catching tuna, it doesn't make sense to fly them to Kansas to offload them or something like that, right? So we have some, indus some industries, some activities that, that are inherently so-called coastal dependent or coastal related. And those types of developments should be favored and things that aren't depending on the coast should be uh, encouraged to go outside of the coastal zone. Go a little bit inland, as it were. Uh, and then in the case of, I mean, for example, in the case of uh, liquefied natural gas terminals, LNG terminals, in that case, those guys were pushed off further out to sea. So they still unloaded their, well, we had, they weren't ever built, but the proposals were to unload that natural gas through pipelines they would eventually come on shore, but where the ships would be and, and the, uh, the docking and that kind of stuff, that was all, gonna, most of the proposals were miles out to sea. So again, pushing it out of the immediate coastal zone. And then lastly, to encourage state and local initiatives um, and to coordinate planning and development. So uh, we'll talk about local coastal plans and all this and that, but so this is the, this is the entity that's gonna manage development in the coastal zone, oversee development of the coastal zone. Now, if we're a city, if we're Oxnard, we still have all our Oxnard rules, right? All of our Oxnard rules as to how big a house we can build and this and that. But the, the Coastal Act is going to act as the regional entity that's going to assure consistency um, amongst, in the context of various things. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, uh, minimizing the light that would otherwise damage snowy plover nests or something like that, right? They're going to act to be consistently up and down the coast so we don't have some places that are really, really bad for, say, this endangered bird and other areas that are better. Okay? Good? Question so far? Have the Coastal Commission Act like ours? Uh, nobody has anything like ours. So others, are try others have tried to replicate what we've done. North Carolina is trying to replicate what we've done. and But, but nobody has uh has has anything as close to the as powerful an entity as the california coastal commission so we're, we're unique in that area so casey's question is, is good so um so uh i guess i can tell the story now i was going to tell a little bit later so we go to north carolina to my friend's to a friend of mine's wedding and uh this is on a barrier island or well the bachelor party, not the bachelor party, I should be careful what I say. The, uh, one of the activities was at this uh, house at the beach. So we go there, super cool house, and uh, multi-story house, and right on the beach, literally around the beach, and this is again, this is the east coast, not like our west coast, up and down coast. It's a very shallow coast, very gentle, gentle slope. So the house, the, the um, first floor, the floor of the first floor is maybe, I don't know, four feet, four or five feet above mean sea level, right? It's very low. And the whole island that we're on is very, you know, maybe the, the peak, it's maybe, I don't know, 20 feet above sea level, if that, above mean sea level. So it's very, very shallow, not like what we have here. And so we're, we're doing this, you know, party thing and stuff, and I'm looking around, and there's a fence. So, so, so it's a sort of long house, and on the right side of the boundary of the house, and on the left side of the boundary of the house are fences. In the, in the starting by the house, going into the dunes, and then going down to the water. And I go out and I look and I say, whoa, those fences go right into the water. And, he, and this guy says, yeah. And I said, well, how does that work? And I said, well, that's our property. And I said, down into the water? Like, yeah. 
So in that place, if we wanted to have a, ro- I'm not gonna have a romantic walk with you, but if, if, if you and your significant other wanted to have a romantic walk, you gotta be careful, right? Don't get went to that training. But um, uh, if you guys are walking down the beach and you hit a fence line, you, you're done. If you cross, you know, say walking in the, on the, the oceanward side of the beach, and you encounter one of these fences, if we stepped over that fence, because we're having a good old time watching the sunset or whatever, uh, you would be trespassing and someone could call the cops and arrest you, right? So it means the beaches truly are private beaches, right? Next, we're, we're talking and I say, man, I, this is crazy. How do you guys keep, as you, if you guys recall, Hurricane Matthew just came through this area just a few weeks ago, right? hey, how do you, this is crazy, you guys have this house here, how do you keep, I can't believe you guys don't have sand that comes in with the big hurricane. Oh, no, no, we, we do. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. So, is, like, how often does sand come in? It's like, well, last time was, this was a few years ago. How long has that happened? Or how often has it happened? Uh, last happened three years ago. Three years ago? Wow, what happened? The entirety of the first floor was sand. So, offshore sand, dunes, whatever, migrated into the house entirely, right? The whole first floor was, was physically full of sediment. And I said, well, that's crazy. I said, how often does that happen? I said, it's happened three times. Three times? Oh, my God. How long have they owned, how long have they owned this uh, house for? And it was something like 12 years. So that gets to FEMA and that gets to risk management and stuff, which is a little beyond what we're talking about today. But, but um, you, you paid for that house, to, you paid for that second house, that vacation house to be bailed out every single time via the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And you can never go walk on that beach. So that's what some of the coastal management policies are like in some other states, right? That would never fly in California in terms, of, in terms of if we were using public dollars to do something with your house, the California Coastal Commission would say, okay, yeah, maybe we need to, maybe you want to do this improvement, but you have to guarantee public access. And indeed, in California, all of the public tide lands, meaning everything from the highest high tide to the lowest low tide is public unless you're on a military base or you know, some, something's restricted for security reasons. You can, you can walk there. And you guys all know this. You guys have all walked in Malibu or whatever, and there's all these signs. There's all these nasty gates. There's all this implication that you can't be doing that. You can't be doing this, right? The implication is that you're on private property. No, you're not. No, you're not, right? So the California Coastal Act was a response to that, to make sure that everybody knows that this is public access, you guys have the ability to do this. Okay, so the California Coastal Commission, getting back to what we're talking about, California Coastal Commission has authority over all new coastal zone development. The stuff that existed before was grandfathered in. So that this, is, this is stuff that was new since 1976, or in reality, new since 1972. So if something is older, such as Paradise Cove in Malibu, that was already existing, um, so that they, they don't necessarily have authority to change the existing stuff unless those folks want to do something new, unless they want to modify their restaurant, unless they want to modify their parking lot or something like that. So the California Coastal Commission has influence over new development. If you've done some old thing in the 1950s and your house is hanging over the cliff, that's, that's okay until it causes a problem. The practice is basically we want to do some type of development. You have that house in the 1950s and you want to put on a new bathroom, a new whatever, or you know, whatever the, the building you want to do is. You would make a proposal and that proposal would go to initially um, the, uh, well, you'd, you'd apply to your local, your local you know, county or city or what have you, but then they would eventually pass it up to the uh, staff of the Coastal Commission. The staff we, we are, who are full-time employees, biologists, folks like you guys might go work for them, right? So biologists, environmental scientists, geologists, etc. They'll look at that proposal and they'll say whether it makes sense or not. If there's a problem with it, they'll 
suggest some recommendations to change, to modify it or what have you. And then the commission, which is normally what you hear most of the talk about, the commission will um, make a decision about this. So the commission consists of 12 voting members and three non-voting members um, that, that do the actual voting. So these folks are appointed for a, a period of time and they are appointed by three different entities within state government. Uh, one third, one third, and one third. So four of them come from the governor. Four of them come from the um, chair of the Senate Rules Committee. And three of them come from the Speaker of the Assembly. And those, those, each of those three entities, they can propose whoever they want. So these folks aren't directly elected, but they are appointed by our elected representatives. Here's our list of current uh, members of the Coastal Commission. So have a look. We have governor appointees, Senate rule uh, uh, chair appointees, and assembly speaker appointees. Um, these are folks that uh, are, you can see the, in this case, uh, Mary's original appointment was on um, August 31st, 2015, and she's serving till 2019. And this is just on the California Coastal Commission's website, so you guys can look at this. So we have these folks that are uh, appointed, and we, um, these are what are sometimes referred to as citizen appointments. Okay, So again, here, here are the Senate rule, two appointments, here are the governors. And these are just folks. These could be, and it's going to depend, right? They make up their own rules. They could be politically connected people. <laughs> Maybe they're an environmentalist, and the person appointing them is a strong environmentalist. So they can come from many sources, any, any sources that the, the folks appointing them uh, want. Then we have uh, the other six are drawn from elected representatives from public bodies within the, the different regions. So we have North Coast, North Central, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and those folks are either uh, city council members, county supervisors, something, uh, something to that effect. And then there are also, um, okay, so I, then I mentioned there, there's three non-voting members. So these are folks that are sitting on the commission that can, that can weigh in and ask questions and all this and that. But when it comes time to actually vote on something, they're not uh, allowed uh, to vote. So that would be uh, the head of the State uh, Natural Resources Agency, the head of the State Lands Commission, um, and uh, the head of the State Transportation Agency. And then lastly, we have um, uh, the alternates. So these are folks that for each, each of those uh, nominees that we have, uh, there's an alternate proposed. So if, if someone's sick or someone uh, has a conflicting meeting, the alternate can go and vote in place of the um, of the, uh, the, the, the regular appointee. Cool? Make sense? Okay, so the main way that the Coastal Commission is gonna exert its influence are through these, these primary routes. First and foremost, coastal development permits. This again, this would be if you have your, your house and you want to add a, and you're in the coastal zone, uh, remind me to talk about that, I think I, I skipped that, but. I'll go back to that in a second. But if you're in the coastal zone um, and you want to do some type of development, some type of land use, build a hotel, modify your, your bathroom, whatever it is, you need a coastal development permit. Sorry. Uh, and, um, okay, so, okay so, so coastal development permit, that, that's pretty much for you, you as the person. Then the other major thing is local coastal programs or local coastal plans. These are plans for a larger area. This can be done by a city. This can be done by a county. And so this is a governmental program that's going to essentially govern the types of activities that are going to be permitted within that, that uh, entity's jurisdiction. These are required by the Coastal Zone Management Act, which is a federal act, which we haven't talked about yet. But um, 
but, but uh, when, we, when we get to talk about that, you'll see that the Coastal Commission is the entity in California that certifies those plans. And the idea is every area up and down the coast needs to have an approved local coastal program or local coastal plan. And uh, these, are, these are hard to do, right? So we're in the process of redoing, for example, Oxnard's LCP. And I think we started that, I don't even remember, six years ago, seven years ago. It had not been updated since the early 80s. So the first step when we started doing that, we had to actually physically type in the old coastal plan because it, was, it, was, it wasn't scanned in, it wasn't anything like that. So, so LCPs are not done every single day. They're, they're you know, every few decades type of thing. Next, the, the Coast Commission is sometimes referred to as a quasi-judicial entity because it can hear um, appeals. So if I, if I applied to my local city in the coastal zone and wanted to add a bathroom onto my house, and if they just immediately said, nope, boom, can't do it, uh, under some circumstances, I can appeal to the Coastal Act, to the Coastal Commission to say, hey, this is permitted under our local coastal program, under our local coastal plan, and it should, it should have been permitted. There's no reason for them to deny it. And in theory, uh, the Coastal Commission could look at that, and if they so voted, they could overturn it and force the city to, to relook at that uh, proposal. Uh, federal consistency determinations, this just says that the activities we're doing are consistent with the, the Coastal Zone Management Act and other things. I think it's important to mention that not everybody likes the California Coastal Commission. Not everyone is happy with the goings-on of the commission. And this most recently came to a very heated head about, um, about 10 months ago. The gentleman that helped write the Coastal Act and was our original director um, and used to talk to you guys, used to, have, used to have him talk to our class, he unfortunately uh, died of cancer a few years ago. And uh, this gentleman stepped in who had been associated with the commission also ever since that time and was serving as the executive director. So just to be clear how these entities work, we have, as I mentioned before, staff and then the elected commission. So the staff, again, draw a salary, they're full-time employees, they do all the logistical, technical, that kind of stuff. The executive director, which is what Mr. Lester was here, um, the, the executive director is also considered a staff member. So in this case, he, but it could be a she, uh, you know, sits, you know, comes to all the meetings, answers questions, etc., does not vote on, uh, uh, on a particular decision but is essentially there as the head of the organization, marshals the staff to do this and that, answers questions, etc. For reasons that are still not entirely clear, uh, some people did not like his performance. And so they gave notice and that in January of this past year, in January 2016, the Coastal Commission had a hearing as to whether they should fire their executive director. This was unprecedented, I would say. It certainly was unprecedented within the Coast Commission, but it was virtually unprecedented within any kind of state organization of this scale and magnitude. Many uh, the hearings up in Morro Bay, many days of testimony were brought. Almost the vast majority was in support of uh, then director Lester and this is a shot from the LA Times of that and it was uh, crazy now what these entities can do we have to rem we have to remember this might be voting on someone's personal pride uh, on someone's um, uh, some development about someone's um, lawn or something in their personal purview or something like that so uh, or it might be having something to do with a lawsuit so these entities routinely, as a state board, um, might go into what's called closed session. This picture is of the open session. This picture is where you guys can go, where we, this year it didn't work out. Many years we actually go to a California Coastal Commission meeting uh, that the timing just didn't work out. 
I, I, did, I didn't mention, but those, these meetings rotate up and down the state of California. Those districts I mentioned, different people are from, the different uh, appointments. The meetings are not always held in Long Beach. They're, they, they'll be, let's say, in Long Beach uh, this month, and then next month it'll be up in uh, you know, Humboldt County, and then the next month it'll be in San Francisco. And then, so they move around the coast with the idea being that if you are a, a proponent that has something before the board, a petitioner before the board, you shouldn't have to drive up to Humboldt County to have your hearing. So the idea is within every few months, there will be a hearing either in your home county or within a relatively short drive, a few hours drive of your home. Um, so in this particular case, um, this hearing happened to be in Central California when, when the meeting came up. And basically, uh, they went into closed session. So unfortunately, we don't know what, we, so closed session is no reporters, no public, only the board members and then the, the lawyers or the staff that are associated with, with the uh, you know, particular legal proceedings or whatever it is that they're discussing are in the room. The California Coast Commission broadcasts and records all of its meetings. You can go and watch the archives of the last meetings. You can watch a streaming broadcast of the current meeting. Again, if it's in, say, San Francisco or somewhere where we can't get to, you guys can all do that. The closed session are not part of that, okay? The closed session is, um, is, 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 is different. Again, this is, this is not a nefarious thing. This is an important duty. If, if you can imagine if this entity, not this entity, but other entities, let's say if they're acquiring land or something like that, they're negotiating price or something like that, they need to be able to talk you know, uh, in closed session Otherwise, the, say the person they were buying the land from would know exactly how much money they were going to pay and you couldn't do effective negotiations. So the fact that they went into closed session in and of itself is not a nefarious thing. What was strange, though, is this was a disciplinary hearing. This was evaluating the job performance of the then executive director. The then executive director waived his right to a closed hearing, meaning that um, he said, no, no, whatever you want to say about me is okay. I'm not embarrassed by it. I won't, be, I won't take legal action. I'm not going to take it as defamatory or anything embarrassing or what have you. So he waived his right to a private hearing. The commission didn't abide by that. The commission said, no, no, no. We're going to have a private hearing. Everybody else leave. They then voted to terminate the executive director, fire him, and almost all of the commissioners that voted, it was, it was a relatively close vote, but almost all the commissioners that voted to oust him left out the back door. Did not uh, engage with the media. And, and since then, most of them have not provided um, what I would suggest is maybe a, a full, complete disclosure of what was going on. They basically said he wasn't performing uh, appropriately, and so we decided to let him go huge controversy. Several bills were spawned out of this in the state legislature to try to, to this, this caused, it's hard to explain what, what kind of firestorm this caused in terms of the coastal management world here in California. The last several months have been a lot of angry people. It is unclear, we don't know completely why this gentleman was released. There are lots of innuendos, there are lots of, of, of suppositions and suggestions, but we don't know. One of the threads says that, well, Mr. Lester didn't do a good job controlling his staff, and the staff were taking a long time to get reports turned around and stuff of that matter, and they weren't responsive to the, com to the, elect to the appointed commissioners. That's one supposed story. Another supposed story is that Forces that were supporting coastal development, more houses, more concrete, et cetera, in the coastal zone, didn't like the fact that the Coastal Commission has been rejecting those plans. And commissioners that were most friendly to that particular view of, develop, uh, of management, of, of resource management, um, decided to oust him. Again, unclear 
which is right, are they both right, are they partially right, whatever. However, it should concern you as California citizens that again, an individual that's been associated with this for decades, this entity for decades, um, and generally speaking, hasn't caused much of a ruckus, right? The purpose of these employees are not to be politicians. The purpose of these employees are to be stewards of the resource and, and follow the procedure, et cetera. The commissioners are the ones that actually vote on, the, on what is appropriate or not. The fact that this person could be sacked and let go with essentially no explanation or effectively no explanation should bother you. The fact that these appointed members by and large have not talked to the media or explained a, in a more um, holistic fashion why this person was let go, that should at a minimum concern you, I would suggest. And again, cause great trepidation among many um, coastal uh, advocates uh, in the wake. So the Coastal Commission does things sometimes, a lot of times, that aren't particularly popular. This is the headline from this morning's LA Times. Do you guys see this? I posted this on our Scoop It site. Did anybody read the story? Short version is this is about the big, somebody tell me about Mavericks. Somebody tell me about the Mavericks contest, surfers. Chris. Is the premier big wave spot in California? And right, so this is just a little bit north of Santa Cruz, uh, south of San Francisco, and the the topography, the, the, the bathymetry of the bottom of the ocean there is really, really good. When, when storms are coming from a certain direction, they can, we can have these monster waves, giant waves, taller than this building, waves. And uh, it's a surf, con so Mavericks is the name of the beach, Mavericks. <coughs> Excuse me. Mavericks is the name of the event. And it's one of these events that you can you can you know, register for, be on the queue, but you never know when it's gonna happen, right? It's, it's when the weather conditions set up and, and, that, the, and that, that creates these, these waves. So when that happens, the call goes out, hey, bloop, 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 we're gonna start the contest in whatever it is, six days or whatever it is. You guys gotta get your butts to California. So that could be folks from, who knows, Santa Cruz? That could be folks from Hawaii, that could be folks from South Africa, whatever, and people fly on in. And then we have these insane surf competitions where these guys r r ride these insane waves. Um, now, uh, to do an activity on the beach requires some stuff. It means you're going to be putting up some booths and, and, and you know, all the kind of stuff that, w just like if we're going to be a party at the park, we're going to be a city permit, right? That kind of stuff. So because in this case, this is happening in the coastal zone, these guys need permits, right? Because they're going to restrict the public's access to an extent. They're going to make sure that, you know, a parking and all this kind of stuff. So today's story, the Coastal Commission said, yeah, that's cool, but by the way, you have to let women surf too. You can't restrict it to only men because this is a public access thing. And it's not saying that women have to participate, but it's saying that there should be an opportunity for women to participate in this. <laughs> there's, there's, there should be an opportunity for women to snap their necks just as fast as guys can snap their necks, is basically what they're saying. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, so, this is, so this, is, this is again the kind of stuff that the Coastal Commission can rule on because it approves these permits, because it approves these development permits, these, these activity permits, et cetera, in the coastal zone. Let's look at a more um, less controversial, well, yeah, by and large less controversial example. Let's talk about um, what's going on with the coast over the next few years. One of the aspects of global warming is um, increased levels of the sea proximate to the coast. And so we're seeing more and more sea level rise and Amongst other things, that's leading to more waves higher up on the coastal bluffs, undercutting the toes, leading to more coastal bluff erosion than we would otherwise have. So we always have some level of erosion, but this is um, clearly going to uh, increase the rate, et cetera, of that. The implication is if we look at this particular uh, uh, housing development in um, 
up north, that's probably not where you want to put your apartment building, right? Right on the very edge of that cliff. Now, to be clear, they, they originally, I believe, in this particular spot, did not put there, did not put it right at the edge, but the edge has eroded. So the fact remains right now, here is this building, and here comes the air, right? The air is getting closer and closer. The cliff is getting closer and closer. So the question is, um, okay, don't allow that development, or don't allow that apartment complex to go right on, on the edge of the cliff, which we probably all can see that, see that how that makes sense. But the challenge is, what if we have this type of condition, right, which we just saw, which is, you know, stuff that was built in the 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever, and it's already here. How are we going to manage that risk? One of the things we hear a lot is, hey, man, this is my property. You can't tell me I can't do whatever the heck I want to do on my property. Wow, that's really bad alignment. Sorry about that. Um, and so what you'll hear from a lot of groups, um, you'll, hear, you'll hear constitutional arguments, specifically Fifth Amendment arguments, saying, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Meaning, hey, if you're going to tell me that, that I can't put cement out here to save my apartment complex, then you got to pay me because you're taking away, you government guys are taking away my, um, my house. It's funny how people don't use that same argument when someone's doing child pornography in their house, right? You could make that same argument. Hey, you said I can't do child pornography in my house, but I could otherwise make money. So you're taking money away from me. Otherwise, I could be making money. People don't use that argument there, but they do use it in this context. So the Coastal Act, uh, Section uh, uh, 3025.3, um, says in part that any new developments, and by new developments, again, we mean any kind of new construction activity, uh, will, first and foremost, reduce risks to life and property in areas that are risky that have a fire risk, that have, a, that have an erosional risk, what have you. That any developments that we put in will be stable and have a high degree of structural integrity, meaning that they'll be able to withstand wind and storms and that type of stuff, environmental stresses. And then importantly, they will neither create nor contribute significantly to erosion, geological instability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we do in this case? Okay, so this is what happens. So I have a house. My house is at the bluff, and, uh, and I want to do something. I want to, I don't know, add on to my porch or some such thing, right? One of the things it'll do is, here's my permit. I want to put this out, and then what's going to happen is, let's say, the staff member that gets this, the Coastal Commission staff is going to look at this and go, hey, is this person on a bluff that's going to uh, be, you know, is it on a stable bluff or is this person on an eroding bluff? So the, one of the first things they'll probably do is go out to the site and, and take a look at this site. Take a look at what the, where the building is right now. How far is it from the top? And so um, in this example, uh, the green is uh, now again with our drones we can do this much more accurately we can do three-dimensional models now within you know a fit for a 15-minute flight so we can do way better than this but back in the day um, and still how a lot of the commission operates this is how they still operate back in the dark ages of linear transects it's crazy anyway uh, so here we go on the x-axis is a uh, different uh, distance uh, from the ocean inland and on the y-axis it's it's height Okay, so what we're, what we're doing is essentially a cross section of the bluff. So starting from right here, which is say the water, you know, the ocean water, and then here's maybe where my house is. So we've gone, these guys, have, the staff have gone out and they've surveyed and they've measured where the cliff face is. In this case, in October 97. Then a few months later, they go back and they remeasure it to look at the rate of change. Here's symbolized in the, the red dots. And with this, so this is a certain number of months difference, so they, they just standardize it to a year, and, they can and we can calculate the so-called retreat rate, 
So how quickly is this bluff eroding? How, how fast is that, that air coming towards my house? And then when we do that, we can say, ah, okay, we're, we have, and how long is this house, how long is this improvement you're gonna put in? Well, I've, this, this bodega, whatever I wanna put there, should last for, I don't know, say my mortgage, I got a 30 year mortgage, it should probably last for 30 years or something. Okay, 30, is that thing gonna be there in, then? So we can multiply the, the lifespan of the activity of the development, and then look at the, how fast it's retreating to get the minimum setback. <clears throat> And so we go through that and we find that, ah, uh, if you want this structure to persist for 30 years, you need to put it, and whatever it ends up being, you need to put it, you know, 100 feet, 150 feet back from the, the edge of the bluff. And if, you, and if you want to propose to put it closer than 150 feet, we're not going to permit it. That's essentially um, one of the ways in which the commission acts. Now, in my proposal, I might have said that I want to put it 100 feet back from the edge. So then the commissioners might come back, or the report might come back, and the recommendation might be, yeah, you should approve this, but don't approve it at 100 feet, approve it at 150 feet. And the commissioners would come together, and they would vote, and maybe they like that, maybe they don't, maybe they take the recommendations of the staff, maybe they don't. But, you, but I, as a developer, or the homeowner, or whatever, would have a chance to go in and testify, and provide some description as to why, um, uh, why, uh, I, I should be able to do the 100 uh, foot setback as opposed to 150 foot setback, etc. Um, okay, and you, there's a, we get more sophisticated. We look at we look at soils and all this and that, but that's the basic idea. <clears throat> the challenge now comes when we have something that's about to go away. So this is not a new development. This is one of my existing houses. Let's say my existing house right here from Southern California. This picture. And um, firstly, you guys interpret this picture to me. What's going on here? We're obviously at the beach looking up. It's obviously eroded a lot. Right, lots of erosion. Anything else you can tell about the history of this place? There's already been some of this reinforcement. Right, there's already been a history of erosion because look, here's this poured, uh, you know, fake Disneyland like concrete bluff structure that was put in to uh, stem uh, the previous erosion. Has it worked? No, this whole part of it is calved off. And this is not just trying to hold the, not just trying to stop the dirt from eroding, but check it out. These pins, these, these bumps here indicate that this thing is being pinned into the, into the Cliff. So it's essentially been, been like nailed. We can imagine it being nailed into the cliff to try to help hold the cliff together. What else? Any other things? You, any other action? Any other mitigation? Mitigating efforts you can see that the homeowners try to do, Chris? They try to do. Uh, I would assume that if there was uh, sandbags or something like that. Okay, no sandbags. But if you look right here, what these are are these are essentially pieces of hanging metal. Or a piece, a piece of, uh, uh, yeah, braided steel, and then there's these these uh, discs or discs or or rectangles of steel. So those are hanging down to essentially break up the speed of the water that's striking the hillside. So this guy poured a bunch of concrete. This guy dangling a bunch of stuff. What else? Can you guys see anything else? What is that pipe right there? Ooh, that's right. What is this pipe? Any idea? Okay, so Chris is right, it has to do with water, but not water washing up. That's a drain pipe. Right. So what does that mean? That means that these guys are watering their plants. And then that water has to go somewhere, so their drain is going down, because otherwise the drain probably originally came straight out right here and was going out in the bluff and was eroding the bluff. So now they're saying, oh man, that's not good. So now they have the water going down into the public beach. Merry Christmas. You're welcome. So there you go. 
What else? Here is some, here's a stairway. Maybe you guys can't quite see this, but this is a, so this is somebody's uh, porch patio. Here's a stairway coming down. Does it go down to the beach now? No. So unclear if that was a public or private access point, but whatever the access was, it no longer exists. You can't safely go to and from the beach using this access point. So this is clearly a bad scene for everybody. This is a bad scene for the public that might be wanting to use the beach, either to access the beach or to walk along the beach. It's a bad scene for the homeowners because their homes are about to fall in the ocean, right? So this is, this is a more typical challenge that we have. Well, I mean, we do have people wanting to do new development, but this is, this is, this is a huge nut. So again, these guys want, this is my house, man. This is my house. I don't want my house going away. So I want to be able to completely armor this, completely secure this, drive new pilings, do, check out this deck. Look at these pilings. Look how deep they're going. That's, I don't know what that is. That's at least probably 20 feet. And then it's probably going another 20, 30 feet in here. That, that's a lot of engineering to hold up this deck. I wouldn't be too excited to walk on this deck right now. Wouldn't be too interested in my son walking on that deck. Wouldn't be too interested in having you guys walk on that deck. Um, and so this guy is saying, oh my God, I paid all this money for my house, high end, who knows, I don't know, million dollars, whatever for this, this coastal front property. And now it's basically gonna be worth nothing, right? So you can understand the homeowner's, trep the homeowner's worry, the homeowner's nervousness. They wanna, they wanna preserve their home, preserve their investment. The public doesn't want chunks of concrete falling on their head. The, and then, does this look like a beautiful, idyllic place you'd wanna come spend the weekend? No, it looks like crud, right? That's not going to draw in tourists. That's not going to draw in folks to your beachside community to spend dollars and recreate and do whatever. So this, this situation doesn't work for anybody right now, right? So the options we have are we could just pull out that, we could just nuke that house, right? Demolish the house, call it a loss, boom. Maybe turn it into open space. That might sound great. The homeowner maybe not too excited to turn to turn her house into a open space for folks. We could pick the house up and move the house or parts of the house or much of the house. So if our lot was large enough, we could scoop, you know, jack the house up essentially and then run it, who knows, 100 feet backward and buy us another 50 years or whatever the case may be, right? We could do what is one of the most popular things, which is to say, screw you, nature. I'm gonna not let you take my house. And that's what, that, that's what the images were, were that we just saw. That was the pouring the concrete, that was the steel baffles, that was the make the water go all the way down to the inner tidal. All that stuff was saying, no way, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna keep it exactly like it is. That armoring is very, that resistance historically has been the most popular approach that has given us places like this armored coastal bluffs or so-called sea walls that um you know this will do a decent job for at least a few decades in keeping your house solid but again mm, not the most attractive thing right also this guy, this is this guy's house this is this guy's private walkway down to the beach. You can't use that walkway. The homeowners and their friends can use the walkway, but you can't. And so while there's not necessarily anything inherently wrong with you having an access way, what's one of the charges of the Coast Commission? Promote public access, right? So by allowing this, are they permitting more public access? No. And so maybe that's a call that that's okay. Maybe it's not. But, but invariably, these types of structures make it more difficult. Now, I'm not encouraging you guys to climb the cliffs because that would be dangerous, right? But at least in theory, beforehand, you could have possibly imagine a trail, a volunteer trail going down the hill. Again, not that I'm encouraging you to do that. But in theory, you, you could maybe go from the bluff down. Now, no way, right? Now it's a sheer drop off this 
concrete cliff, wooden cliff, right? So these, so these types of structures are problematic. Also, as Dr. Patch will tell you, her whole dissertation was about measuring how much sediment goes into our beaches. And turns out, the big question, I'll tell you the answer, the big question is, was it, it, does the sediment come from rivers or does it come from eroding cliffs and places like that? Turns out a little bit comes from rivers, but very, 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 very little. Much less than she originally thought. So here in Southern California, this erosion of these bluffs provide the majority of the sediment that's, that, that feed these littoral cells, that feed our beaches and keep our beaches wide. So the, the more and more we armor, we're essentially robbing our beaches down current. So in our case, it's mostly southern or more easterly of that point of sediment. And then we got to do a nourishment project. And then the city of Port Wainimi is all ticked off and their houses are flooding because the beaches are getting too narrow. The people in Broad Beach are super angry. And we got to spend all this money to move sand from Moore Park out there and all these, all these challenges, right? So these are, these are real consequences of these, of these decisions that the, that the Coastal Commission has to balance, has to figure out what is okay, what is not okay. Right, you guys, so seawalls should be pretty obvious to you guys. Essentially, it's armoring the coast. <clears throat> Note, here's another section of the Coastal Act. So I'll read the important parts. That the Coastal Commission should act to permit these types of structures when required to serve coastal dependent uses or to protect existing structures or public beach, beaches in danger from erosion. So again, as we mentioned, these entities, these regional entities that have broad charges that aren't narrowly focused, that, ha that have a lot of you know, things to do in their to-do list, it gets hard because the, the Coast Commission both has to promote public access, let's say, minimize risk, but also, here's another part, saying that they have to permit these structures when it would be necessary to, to protect certain things. So these decisions are all going to be, to an extent, a judgment call. This isn't a simple cut and dried, obvious what every single vote should be, how every single vote should go. <clears throat> and to be, and to be, uh, to just to reiterate this, this should be obvious from the stuff we've just been watching. But, but it's more than just personal property at risk. Uh, in places like San Diego, where we have relatively erodible cliffs, it's not uncommon, unfortunately, to have folks being underneath a cliff and that cliff can collapse on top of them. So, so there are, are risks to people, uh, people's lives as well as just uh, natural infrastructure and, hu and, and artificial infrastructure. So to summarize, the Coast Commission has to, in these types of situations, make these judgment calls. They have to evaluate the risk. In general, if the risk isn't something right now, they'll usually punt and say, no, you can't do that activity. When that's not an option, they will next try to explore alternatives. Hey, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. And try to assure that the option that is ultimately selected is the least damaging, the least negatively impacting. And this is, I think, perhaps one of the most important aspects of this. We see this increasingly in our environmental uh, policies, definitely in regionalism, broadly writ, which is, okay, we've got we to gotta evaluate each case as a unique situation. Evaluate each case on its own merits, you'll hear people say. Well, that makes sense, right? We all agree with that. Hey, you want to cut down that oak tree? Let's, let's talk about why you need to cut down that oak tree, right? So that makes total sense. But the challenge is that most of these entities, like the Coastal Commission, are supposed to look at the cumulative impacts, right? Look at not just the fact that this guy's house got permitted, but what's the effect of all these permits that we gave over the last 20 years? Oh my God, you know, approving a house or two here or there doesn't sound like that big a deal. But when we go back and look over the last 20 years, oh my gosh, we permitted the equivalent of 25 miles of armoring or something to that effect, right? That's the hard part, right? That's the hard part. 
Because this, this guy is sitting there telling you how important this house is for his family's history and blah, blah, blah. And this is super important. This is all my, all my financing is in here. I just, got, I just lost my job because the economy's not great and this and that. And now you want to kick me out of my house, right? It can be very compelling reasons why that particular permit should be granted. And maybe it should be. But at some point, you have to evaluate. You can't just only look at the one-off, 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 one-off. I'll tell you a story, and then we'll, we'll take a break. So the story that I like to tell is from one of our, <clears throat> we're currently redoing some of our uh, Ventura County ordinances. But this is from the last time we redid this about eight years or so ago. And um, <clears throat> this was a public forum where we had a bunch of folks that were providing input. And this gentleman specifically spoke about the goings on in Westlake Village. So if you guys haven't been there, <clears throat> what's it called? Um, what's the lake by there? Uh, the landing. What's it? The landing. No, not the landing. Um, the, where the golf course is? Sherman. Sherman Oak. No, not Sherman Oak. Sherwood. Sher lake Sherwood. Thank you. That Lake Sherwood. Thank you. So it's about Lake Sherwood. <clears throat> so this gentleman had a large uh, piece of property that his family has had for decades and decades and decades out out uh, out there and um, essentially what happened was some big developers came in William Murdoch Fox News those guys came in and bought the land that we now consider Lake Sherwood in the 70s and turned it into this super super upscale high-end McMansion place so there's there's you know giant uh, golf course it's where Tiger Woods used to have his big um, his big uh, uh, a tournament every year, and there's these very, very, very expensive homes, all behind a gated community, all that stuff. All green lawns, even though the rest, everybody else letting their lawns die, that kind of situation. Um, and they, they cut down a gazillion oak trees, because this was rolling hills, oak woodlands, coastal foothills types of communities. And they chopped all that stuff down and put in these giant houses. This gentleman did not on his house on his property. Um, flash forward to uh, 10 years or so ago, he's trying to do some building on his property, relatively small property. He wanted to cut down a couple oak trees for whatever, I don't, I don't remember, a barn or something like that. At this point, the city of Thousand Oaks, which he falls into the, the jurisdiction of, Set, had passed an oak tree ordinance. It says you're not allowed to cut down oak trees above a certain size, etc. And he essentially was not allowed to put his barn in. And the guy was ticked off. So we came to this planning meeting and essentially highlighted point three right here, which was, his point was this, I'm a great steward of the land. I promote native grasslands. I plant a gazillion oak trees. I do all this stuff. I, 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 have solar power. I do all these things to minimize my impact on the environment. I would like to cut down a couple oak trees to do this thing so that my kids can live on the property. I'm prevented from doing that because you guys allowed the big powerful developer to nuke all these trees years ago. And you like that because that gave you tax revenue and this and that, right? I didn't get a benefit from that, right? But you guys permitted that. And now when I want to do a relatively minor impact on a parcel of land that's still home to mountain lions and, and, and bobcats and all that kind of good stuff, you're telling me I can't do it? That's messed up. So that is the highlight of this point three, which is we want to evaluate each case on its own, but we can't just do that, right? If we just did that, we'd have no oak trees left or whatever. So there needs to be some sense of fairness and appropriateness here, but yet, you know, an eye towards the aggregate impacts. So the point with that, the point for me explaining that and talking about this is to say this is not an easy call. This is this is a challenge, and to simply uh, sometimes these debates get boiled down to like this guy hates the environment, this guy all he uses a tree hugger, this and that. That's not appropriate. These are much more sophisticated discussions. And many times there is not an easy, obvious answer. So much development has gone on in the coastal zone, as you guys know about, because we all love it so much, everybody wants to be here. By definition, on into forever, this, this is going to be the challenge. Balancing individual petitions 
with this aggregate impact. And regionalism is an approach to help us do that better. The California Coastal Commission is an attempt to help us do that better. But it nevertheless is, is, um, is a hard thing to do. Cool? So, um, so the Coastal Commission affords an opportunity to look at real policy as it's enacted. It's very clear that a lot of times we're forced to make decisions that aren't ideal. Um, there's great value in looking at case studies and see how folks handled problems maybe similar to this in the past. Nothing might be exactly identical to something before, but there might be some great solutions that folks have proposed or a great solution that you're thinking of that turns out it didn't work. So case studies are really, really helpful in these contexts. Um, role playing can be helpful. It's really helpful when we try to take on the perspective of these other folks, right? And it really, I think, helps um, get a sense of where people are coming from and not be so dictatorial or, or, um, or jerky. Uh, yeah, I, we, this is very quick. Don't, don't write this down. But just examples of other regional, uh, regionalism besides the California Coast Commission, something like the Southern California, Ca Southern California Association of Governments, which is mostly dealing with transportation and environmental impacts. Um, we're a part of a so-called SCAG um, that's designed to do long-term planning, et cetera. Um, another example would be Metropolitan Water District. Uh, which is uh, the entity that dis collects and distributes water um, in the greater Los Angeles region. Um, we have a lot of cities that are a member of the MWD, and we have a lot of water districts that are members. So our surrounding water districts here are part of the MWD, and they get water allocations from that entity. And we participate in the regional in, in, in the MWD governing body. Right? We provide input in terms of water allocations, et cetera. So another example of trying to manage, in this case, water supply uh, to ensure adequate water supply, boost reliability, et cetera. Uh, in this case, it's a 37-member board as opposed to our 12-member California Coastal Commission. Um, but similarly, again, appointments from throughout the representative bodies. 